sure, they're young and they're fit, but they're European. They're soft. Hammocked in their social security safety nets, sick on vacation mania on free healthcare. They may think they're Vikings, but we've been raised by wolves, exposed to a pathogen that goes by the name Logan Roy, and they have no idea what's coming to them. Welcome to HBO's official Succession podcast. I'm Kara Swisher, and this week, it's Kill or Be Killed. You know, if a deal collapses in the woods and no one hears it, is it an SEC violation? Yeah, well, I don't care what you think. You're a tribute band. Let's go get the deal. Let's get it. Let's bleed the Swede. All right. Today, we dive into Episode 5, Season 4, with CEO bro Roman Roy. Kieran Culkin is on the episode. And later, I unpack the tactics and dude energy of the Waystar Gojo deal with one guy who's done this stuff in real life, Dick Costello, the former CEO of Twitter, or as I like to call him, not Elon. I do hope the Waystar Gojo transition goes more smoothly than Twitter's, but I highly doubt it. This episode, titled Kill List, was written by John Brown and Ted Cohen and directed by Andre Paulrek. It's been two days since Logan died, and the Waystar gang is called to Norway to land the Gojo deal. Roman and Kendall face off with tech whiz kid Lucas Matson and are immediately thrown when he changes the terms. He wants ATN. Meanwhile, Shiv wins Matson's trust and learns some truly creepy stuff about this microdosing billionaire. She advises him to bump the price, making the deal too good to turn down, and her brothers, who had wanted to keep Waystar for themselves, are left deflated. Sorry, boys, it's time to sell to the Viking. We're selling. It's like, have we won or lost? It's kind of hard to tell. Joining me now is the unrivaled Kieran Culkin, Roman Roy himself. Welcome, Kieran. Oh, thanks. Unrivaled, huh? Well, there isn't another one by your name that I know of at this moment in time. It's kind of true. We're halfway through the final season, and Roman is finally co CEO. Do you think he even likes the job? It's only been one day and he seems pretty tired of it already. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot to take on, I think. I mean, even with two of us trying to split the work, I think uh, the moment you take over a huge company like that, there's just too much to catch up on. So it's exhausting, but I think he's up to it. I think what you might be reading is sort of the emotional thing that Matson is putting us through, making us get on a plane, forcing us and feeling like meant to feel small. We just took over as co-CEOs and we're running around for some guy. Right, for some guy. And he calls you the tribute band. Yeah, there's all sorts of things like that, which is, is meant to make us feel small. So I didn't like in the first place having to get on a plane and run to some guy and he's going to mock us when our, our our dad isn't even cold yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's barely been two days. And it's also not how Roman wanted to become CEO. He His pre-grieving of his dad doesn't seem to have worked, Correct. I would say so. When I saw that in episode four, because I was I was very curious to see how the next day was going to play out for everybody. And I was a little bit curious about it. And normally I feel like I would speak up and say like, oh, I'm not sure if Roman would act that way. And then I had to wrap my head around it. I took a day or so to get into it. And I said, no, I, I guess I understand that he believes that he's pre-grieved. And mm-hmm. uh, I had it make sense to me in that day. And while we shot that episode, that made sense. Somebody can feel like they're one thing one day and the next day something else. Right. Or that could have been a declaration of strength that he was trying to say, I was, I'm done. I'm OK. And I think Roman kind of believed like, oh, this is going to be OK. I actually feel fine. I'm in touch with my feelings and my feelings say this is all right. You've been anticipating. So I think he meant it. I don't think it's long lasting, that feeling. No. And also it's easy to be triggered by some guy saying, making some joke about our dad, mocking us and telling us we have to get on a plane and we have to do his bidding for the switch to flip and and say, you know what, I'm not over this. I'm not okay right now. And direct it as anger at one person. Yeah, exactly. Now, in the episode, the group goes to Norway. It's a lot of fun for the viewer because visually it's quite beautiful. But the Roy kids never seem to be having fun despite the settings, yeah. uh, largely because of the grief. So talk about the dynamics of the show where you go to these beautiful places, but the kids are always in distress. Yeah, I mean, there's, somebody said something like, leave it to Jesse to like fly us out to Italy and shoot in a cubicle or something right. like something that isn't very glamorous. <laughs> we do that a lot. Um uh-huh. It's funny you say that because when I was in Norway, I was actually, I personally was miserable being there. Everyone was so happy to be there. I didn't want to be away from my kids for 11 days. Yeah. I actually, I get immediately depressed if I'm away from them for more than a day. I know the feeling. Yeah. And there was something about being somewhere so beautiful that 
just accentuated how miserable I was. That whole time I would look up and see these fjords and go, ugh, fuck you. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm over it. Like, I don't want to see it. This is an ad for Norway. It's fuck you fjords. I was so miserable when I was out there. But the one day off, I saw this amazing hotel mm -hmm. and I'm going to get back there. I'm bringing my wife and kids to that place. Like, I want to actually go back there and experience Norway the right way. Because it is, it is beautiful. All right. Well, in this one, you didn't. No. And you can feel Logan's absence. And this is where yeah. he'd normally be wheeling and dealing. And now it's left in your hands, uh, yours and your siblings' hands. Let's listen to a clip. Well, Dad wanted to keep ATM. Uh, yeah, but he also wanted to poison Brezhnev and, and hang Mandela. It doesn't mean he's always right. Mm. I think that overall, he wanted the deal, so... Well, we don't know. We, we can't navigate by Dad maps. He's not here. Talk about that idea of dad maps, because Roman wants to navigate by dad maps, yeah. I think, more than any of the kids. Why is it important for him to keep this deal of his dad's? Yeah, dad maps. That's good. I feel like the way Roman saw himself getting into that position was by following his dad, mm -hmm. going by the dad maps, and dad one day stepping down, and me just sort of taking over and keeping the ball rolling the mm -hmm. way he set it off. So now that I'm dealing with my brother, who wants to do things a bit differently is what's making that kind of difficult as well. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of that, like trying to keep the deal structured as is or shitting on the deal uh, that feels like something Logan would do mm -hmm. and that we want to honor him. You can hear dad in our heads if we just let him take the whole thing and take ATN and all that. We can hear dad saying you'd bent for him and we're just not going to do that. Right. That's precisely how he'd put it. It's tough to let the emotional thing get in the way of it. And I think that's the part that Roman's struggling with the most is I don't have hand right now. I don't have any, I'm not in any good position right now to negotiate mm -hmm. with this guy. And normally I think Roman would be very good at that. I think he would know exactly how to talk to Matson, but he's not in a very good position to start with. And he's caught up in too many emotions for him to be in. Right. And what's interesting is all three of you have elements that if together would be great if you could work together, um, yeah. talents and stuff. But the alliance between the three siblings crumbles in this episode of over the deal. Does Roman even realize that's happening? I think for Roman, I'm like too caught up in his own uh, emotional headspace to really, it's trying to be protective of dad while also trying to bury dad and wrap my head around that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that anger about dad dying is directed at one person. Mm -hmm. So I, I think he's a little blind to seeing anything like that. And, uh, you know, the coming episodes, uh, that gets maybe a little clearer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in the last episode, I spoke with Sarah Snook. She thinks Shiv was most like Logan. You kind of see it here. She's cold and blunt. Fuck it. It's a toxic asset. Do you agree with Sarah? No, I, I wholeheartedly believe that Roman is most like Logan. <laughs> Tell me why. Tell me why. Um, Because Shiv says something to him once about like, no, it, it, you're not always right. You just say something and then it becomes so. And then you can always say, yeah, uh, something like that. And I think he sort of just makes it up. Uh, he's just a big blagger for the most part, and he just happens to be pretty smart and right, and he surrounds himself with people. I think Roman is quite a bit like that. I think it's interesting that she would even say that because I, I don't I don't see her much like Logan at all. I mean, she's not as far as like Ken is from Logan, but I always saw that like if one of the two of them took over, they would try to reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. whereas Roman would want to keep it in the way that Dad structured it. Yeah, he's certainly not as cruel as Logan had been. No, no, but I think he would know how to delegate really well. And I think if he was given the position of power, I think he would know how to run the company the way that he saw dad doing it for his entire life. Right. Uh, I even think like just now popped in my head that even Shiv's politics are wildly different than dad's. Mm -hmm. She'll be like, we can't do that because we have to, you know, think about the country. And Logan would just like, what? The country? The country is a concept. It's not real. It's just it's what makes good business sense. So I would say she's... I would say, no, no, Snook, <laughs> no. In the past, uh, Roman would have used Jerry as an advisor, but that sort of romance uh, is over. Where do they stand at this point? He fires her, although nobody really knows that, mm -hmm. except for the two of them, uh, a man that is now dead, and Tom. Mm -hmm. And Tom has to be very careful right now with what he does. So mm -hmm. at this point, it's hard to separate the business and the personal for the two of them. Mm -hmm. So... Part of me, I think, you know, Roman getting a little too caught up in, yes, dad has just died. I think like when even on the boat in episode three, when Jerry comes in, it's like he's completely forgotten. He's been in this bubble of what's happening with dad and, and trying to 
keep a little bit of denial going with that when Jerry comes and it's like, oh yeah, I thought this was the worst day of my life. I forgot I fired her and now I have to deal with her coming in. Mm -hmm. And that turns into anger that he just throws at her. Right. So, and these next couple episodes that we see, you know, yes, he's CEO, there's a ton of work. There's all this stuff that we're doing. I think like Jerry, as much as it would be a heavy weight, there's too much going on for him. He just sort of sets it aside and hopes to get to it later, but he's not processing things very well right and she hardly matters if you were to ask him honestly and he had the space for it he would say yeah let's just pretend the firing thing never happened you're good i'm good everything's good like let's just hug it out and i'm sorry i was right terrible day big mistake but i don't think he has the time and space to take that but they have that whole background too they have their own personal background too at the same time well yeah and i think he would really need her if he wants to if he's co-ceo and if he really wants to get to the top there himself, he's going to need Jerry, I would think. And he knows that. Yeah. So I want to talk about your big confrontation with Matson. It's Roman's breaking point. What a scene. Let's listen to that. Hey, I was just thinking, do you remember when you asked when my dad was going to die? Yeah, that was a joke, Roman. Uh -huh. You really couldn't push this a week, could you? You just couldn't, like, there was no part of you that could just be like, hey, let's reschedule and move this because, you know, their dad just died. And, you know, I mean, my sister's kind of, She's fucked up about it, and her brother's a mess, and I'm fucking, I'm gone. I'm like, I'm on the fucking, I'm dead. It's over for me. It's okay. It's fine. It's, but you just drag us out here, you inhuman fucking dog man, you. Crazy. Easy, brother. You, you fucking killed him, too. You're the one who did it. You just, and you did. You drained the life out of him. You dragged this thing out for six fucking months, and then you bring us out here now. You couldn't wait, like, a few days. You actually couldn't do that for us. No idea, huh? God. Yeah, go. shut the fuck up, man. We're not selling to you, okay? We're not doing that. We are gonna grind you down, man. We are sand in the gears. Every email's gonna take like six months. We're all gonna spend hundreds of millions of dollars. And in the end, you're gonna get fucking bored and move on. It's not happening, okay? Really? Yeah. Yeah, I fucking hate you. So, wow, what a scene. His grief is exploding. What pushes him over the edge? And Matson is thinking it's a negotiating ploy, obviously. Right. Uh, which, you know, Roman might like to say after the fact it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's he's sort of um, emotionally unhinged there, I believe. I think that's just the moment when it he loses it and he decides he's not going to play business anymore. I'll let the feelings come out. It's not a move, I think, in mm -hmm. that moment. It's not. It's just honesty and how he's feeling and, and all the anger uh, about his dad comes out at one person who does, you know, in my opinion, deserve that. Right. And he says, I'm dead. It's over me. I'm fine. It's fine. He seems really lost. What do you think he wants right now? Does he even know? No, I don't think he has a bloody clue uh, what he wants or what he needs or what he's doing. Very much overwhelmed. At least, thank God, there's like a trajectory for him. That's the way I sort of mm -hmm. saw it. That whole sort of busy hands or happy hands. Just taking over and taking that on is is one huge thing. And then trying to fuck this deal and get rid of this guy and restructure the, the business a bit is all he can think about. It's like, thank God I'm at least very busy because I have no idea how to process these things. Right. And from a business perspective, though, it's frustrating to watch because all I want is them to sell out and get out and take the money and enjoy themselves. And Waystar feels like yeah. a trap for these kids. Do you think that or as, as someone who's developed this character? Yeah. And I think that when the show started, Roman was in and he just got ousted. And I think that Roman saw himself as a, a bit more of a, of a um, creative, which is why he liked being at the movie studios, like right. he throwing out ideas and things like that. And it wasn't the right fit for him. So finding his way back in and finding his voice and realizing there's something he can do with the company and his life has felt really good. And that's what draws him back in because otherwise, you know, his view he's kind of just like a rich schmuck who sits at home mm -hmm. he's just the son of somebody important and right. that's not a very nice feeling which and you tried to make the 100 yeah but i always thought roman was kind of fine a little bit of denial like you know when you see roman at the very beginning of the show say look i'm out i don't care like i'm out of this building thank god i'm out i never made it this high in the building you know i think there's a bit of denial there i think he likes it he wants it it's sort of yeah, it's bad for him. It's bad for them. And I think he's aware of it. And part of Roman wants to just say, fuck it. I'm going to throw in the towel. Uh, let's take the money. Let's do something else. And that's you're, you're exactly right. I think why he liked the hundred so much is it it's still business. It's something. It's us. It's together. It's family. But it's new. And we're not trapped in the same thing. Yeah, but they abandoned it in a second to get back into this. Yeah, which I 
Roman doesn't really like. I think he likes the idea like, okay, well, if we abandon that and we get Pierce, then Pierce becomes our new project and that's fine. So he needs a project instead of the money. Yeah. So I think even if they do sell, he'll be, he would be fine. Like, you know, if that ended up going that way, but I think what's driving him right now is sort of dad and dad's honor. Just act like dad's here right now because he's, I can't even wrap my head around the fact that he's gone. He's here. So what would he do? Let's make him proud. Which is what he does all the time. He's the one that most wants to honor his dad more than any of them. I think so. But the last time Roman talked with his dad was that voicemail on the boat where he kind of stood up to Logan. Yeah. How much does Roman think about that voicemail? Does he regret it? He might not have heard it. Right? Uh, I, I think that's one of those, like a few moments after finding out, he questions if, you know, was that maybe did dad hear it? Is that what did it? Did I kill dad? Mm -hmm. But I've actually thought about that. I actually think he pushed that aside. Mm hmm. Uh, I think that's the first time he did anything kind of close to standing up to dad. And it wasn't even, it was just saying that you're awful and are you a cunt? Mm -hmm. He wanted to confront his dad basically, but I like that he left it in dad's hands to be like in a voicemail, which is sort of cowardly, but also say, call me, call me back and tell me why you made me do this, which was a pretty strong position. I right. think, no, I think he pushed that down, pushed that deep, deep down. So it never bothers you. Never again. <laughs> yeah, maybe you never heard it. Roman is the CEO now, but over the years, he's done a number of things in the company, management training in parks. He tried to mm. defund that movie, The Biggest Turkey in the World. We can't forget that he blew up a rocket. What's your favorite of Roman's many projects? I love the rocket and him trying to get it expedited so it could be on the wedding day for some reason. Like he just had some, like he, I, I guess to some extent he was trying to steal Shiv's Thunder. Mm-hmm. And that blowing up in his face, he's given one project, which is pretty simple. It sort of runs itself. And then he stuck his nose in when he should have just stood back and taken the credit for other people's work. Mm -hmm. He poked them and it blew up and it blew up in his face. Somebody lost a couple of thumbs, you know? Yeah, yeah a couple of thumbs, one or two. Yeah. All right. Last thing I do before we leave, I want to share our favorite lines from the episode. And I'll tell you my favorite. Tobbs, I think, is Norway, Sweden. What's the difference? They're all descended from the same rapists. <laughs> Jesus. God, Matthew always gets the really, really good ones. Matthew and Alan. You get some good ones. Come on. Oh, that's true. Okay. Is there a moment in this one? Do you think is that is that scene with Matson where he lets the grief out? Yeah. And you know what's what's funny about that, that 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 this is connected to what I was talking about about being miserable and somewhere very beautiful. We shot that on a mountain top and the three of us in the camera crew were all up there. We're shooting for a couple of hours. And then when we finish, we have to go down to like the halfway point in the mountain to go shoot something else. Mm -hmm. uh, we get down there and I'm told we have about an hour for them to reset. And I went, oh, then I should go back to the top of the mountain because I didn't actually look at it. <laughs> I went up there and then looked around and went, oh, this is stunning. This is gorgeous. And I was too caught up in the the anger and everything that was like I was going to be throwing at Matson, and I really felt like I hated it when I was up there that I just couldn't take it in and I feel like that's how Roman must have been that entire time they're on a mountaintop and he just resents the fact that he took a chopper and we had to take a freaking gondola or whatever the hell it was that we had to take up yeah the mountainside and then and then walk it's just an extra insult I think he couldn't see it so that sort of stands out to me it's just like the setting could be so beautiful. But you got to see the mountain. You, Kieran, got I to did. see the I did. I went back up there and I sat on a rock for about 20 minutes by myself in quiet and looked at it and went, hey, this is actually really lovely. Which I think is something people don't think about you. Is that hard to separate? Do people not see you as Kieran? They think you're like this guy. You've made such a impact with this character. Oh, yeah. Even people that like I've been working on the show with for a long time will be surprised that I'm not like this guy. I've had a couple people, this is like the most insulting thing you can say to someone, but I guess it's because they've known me as playing Roman, but people will be like, oh, you read, you read books. <laughs> it's like the most <laughs> insulting thing you can say. To I'm like, And a number of people that I worked with on the show have said that to me. I'm like, okay, I'm, I, you know, that's like a mean thing to say. Yes, I read books. Yes. Yeah. Just because the character I play doesn't seem like he reads books and maybe he doesn't. Uh, doesn't mean I'm that guy. What are you reading right now? At the moment, nothing, because I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and I'm always freaking working. Hello, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I know that. Yeah. I have a 17-year-old and a 20-year-old. When do you start reading books again? I've been asking people. They were like, oh, once they get in school. You know what? I was about to, and then I had two more children, so I don't know. Probably when I'm 85. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Perfect. Perfect retirement plan. I keep buying books. 
that that I do. Like every couple of months, I buy books and go, ooh, and then I bring it home. My, my wife sees it and go, what are you doing? All right. Put that in the shelf for a couple of years. I would say re- start with something small, like a like a billboard, and then move on from there. <laughs> something like that. Um, let me ask you one more question. What do you like him? Because I think I, I asked this of Brian Cox, because he is, you know, he is Logan Roy in a, in a way. And is there anything that you find that you're like him? Everybody, I mean, I would say certainly everybody in the show has elements of them that are in the character. I feel like that goes for most actors and almost any performance. They're going to find something that's true to them that they can connect to the character. So there's certainly stuff I can occasionally, but I more do it as Roman where I'll just do like a stream of consciousness thing where I just don't stop talking. And not a lot of it makes the show, but like in takes, I'll just like keep going and insulting people and do that. I can, I'm a bit like that in life. Yeah. But he's, thank you for saying that because it's a, he, I, I see him as, quite different than myself but sometimes people on meeting me will say like oh you're just like your character i'm like i really i'm really not (laughs) at all like that guy you're all terrific anyway i appreciate it and you probably will be sleeping just for someone who's had so many children around 2035 that's when you'll get a good night's sleep yeah that sounds about right i really appreciate it it's such a pleasure you've done an amazing job on this thank you and excited to see how it all turns out thank you very much Now it's time to dive into the real world of succession. And today we're discussing what it's like to be in the middle of a high stakes business deal. Joining me now is Dick Costello, venture capitalist and former CEO of Twitter from 2010 to 2015. Welcome, Dick. Thanks for joining me. Happy to be here. I'm happy to talk about deals. I don't know anything about high stakes deals. I know a lot (laughs) of low stakes deals and no stakes deals. I needed to talk to someone who's seen these shakeups at big media companies. In this episode, Waystar goes to Norway for a cultural compatibility check. I feel like I've been to that meeting. (laughs) So how realistic is it? So I think the cultural compatibility check is a real thing. I think doing that before you've agreed to whether you're doing a deal and what the price is, is unrealistic. Yeah. You wouldn't send your whole team there until you had come to some sort of agreement. He thinks they have a deal, right? They think they have a deal, I guess, and then they don't. But aside from the fact that you wouldn't go send everybody over there until you signed a term sheet or something on the dotted line, Mm -hmm. those kinds of things happen. You know, when we sold FeedBurner to Google, Post, Mm -hmm. you know, the signing, they're like, okay, now we want to interview all your engineers and everybody on the sales team and to see if they're googly. And I remember, you know, we were in the Midwest at the time. We were like, what do you think that means? (laughs) But when you think about that cultural compatibility, though, do the executives go off and have a little moment together, a little massage and a steam? (laughs) I think it's less of a massage and a steam as it is in this episode and Mm -hmm. more like the executives going off into a conference room and having a discussion about, you know, what's going to be like for a CEO to come work at this company and not be the CEO anymore. And it's a lot less compelling than the than the Nordic retreat. Yeah, but you do you do these dinners. I mean, I remember you talking about the fireside thing when you almost bought Instagram, right? You were trying to get them to like you. Yeah, during those courting periods, you're definitely hosting dinners and trying to pull people in who are investors in both companies maybe and are trying to <laughs> push things together. That all 100% goes on. What's the craziest thing you've done? What's the silliest thing? I think it's more about like, okay, where can we meet where people won't go Oh, what's the you know CEO of Twitter and and you know Kevin and Mike from Instagram? What are they talking about? So you're kind of trying to have those get-togethers at you know out of the way places and coffee shops and the back room at you know instead of walking into the restaurant and like reserving the back private room and going in the mm-hmm. side door and all that stuff. I remember one time we were talking to Jay Z now about this is when he wants to start Title and we reserved the private restaurant I think at Park Tavern. And it was upstairs and Jay Jay came through some like side entrance to get into the restaurant room. And of course, the challenge was there's no like bathroom in the private room. So he's got to run downstairs to use the restroom in the main restaurant. And he comes back up laughing. And you're like, what are we? What are you laughing at? He's like, I'm laughing because the guy next to me in the bathroom is like triple taking the whole time. And I know he just went back to his seat and said, hey, man, Jay-Z's here. And they're all yeah. like looking around going. Because <laughs> they couldn't see him. He's like, no, no, he was next to me. Jay-Z, it's Jay-Z. And they're all, all his friends are looking around in the main restaurant going, oh, dude, yeah. Jay-Z is not here. <laughs> so there's a rumor of a kill list in this episode of who will be laid off after the Gojo deal. It reminds me when Elon bought Twitter, I think he just pointed at everybody and said, you're gone. Um, <laughs> 
There were rumors of layoffs and stories of people sobbing in the bathrooms, people being sorted out during a holiday party. When an acquisition like this happens, how many people usually lose their jobs and how is it done? How do you think about it? It happens for sure. It's done very, very differently at different places. It can be done in, I'd call it gracious ways, and it can be done in less than gracious ways. So one of the things that happens, just to be perfectly blunt about it, is the acquirer is usually going to say something like, well, how much more efficient can we make the business when it's part of you know, sure. Twitter or Big Co? And one of the ways to gain efficiency is, is, well, we already have an HR and a finance and a, you know, whatever department. Those kinds of functions are more typically like, okay, we're, you're not going to be part of the ongoing organization. So the best way to stay off is to be like an engineer or designer. <laughs> There's all sorts of different strategies for staying off the hit list. Um, yeah. But uh, those general administrative functions, they usually get condensed, consolidated. Get whacked, yeah. Whacked in your parlance. <laughs> there are always people who are going up to the execs at the new company and going, you know, hey, I'm invaluable. You're going to want to keep me around. Yeah. That that kind of stuff totally happens. And we can think whatever we want to think about those people who immediately are be like all out for themselves. So it was interesting, speaking of which, seeing the Waystar characters meet their bizarre European doppelgangers. <laughs> their Viking counterparts. Did anything strike you as the face-off between this American media company and the Swedes and the big cultural differences? Is that typically the case? You definitely get the sense from the European tech and media executives that the Americans all think they're the smartest people in the room and mm -hmm. doing things the way everyone else should be doing them. And, you know, I remember um, switching gears when I was advising Silicon Valley, uh, the HBO show for a couple of years, the writers in the writers room at Silicon Valley thought it was endlessly funny that every company in Silicon Valley they would go to would say, you know, we're changing the world. We're <laughs> What we're doing is changing the world. And, they, and these guys would be like, don't you guys just enable people to post cat videos or like reviews of local restaurants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well, you don't understand. We're changing the way people, you know, view yeah. society and like, okay, if you say so, he's like, and they would always go, you know, the people on the second floor downstairs also say they're changing the world, right? You guys realize yeah. that you all say that. Uh, so <laughs> I think the European, in many cases, European tech and media companies have that sense that you know, these American tech execs take themselves way too seriously and think they're, you're maybe not the smartest guy in the room that you think you are. Yeah. You know, you worked on uh, Silicon Valley on the series, which is more of a mockery, really a mocking. Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how many things happened in that show that I had like nothing to do with and completely made up. And people would text me and go, hey, I can't believe you told them about that thing <laughs> that we did at, you know, Company X. <laughs> I was like, I didn't. Like, no, 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 that's absolutely, you told them, you must have, you're the only one who knows. Like, no, 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 they made that up in the room. Yeah, how close is Madsen's Gojo to someone? It reminds me of a couple people. He's definitely a character type that you see in tech. Mm -hmm. You know, minus the... Um, direct personal insults. A lot of the characters are the kinds of people you see in tech. I would say they're, yeah. they're definitely personality types like that. Yeah. You know a thing or two about in negotiations and big deals like what Roman and Kendall are trying to do with Matson. So I want to yeah. dive into that. Let's listen to a bit of their first meeting. We've come to say that um, we like your offer, but we don't as yet think it reflects the full valuation of the potential of what you're purchasing. Okay. And your stock dropped 20% on Friday? And regained 10 Monday. OK. Logan was never going to be part of the company going forward. I mean, on, on a business sense, his absence is not relevant. Our key growth drivers are unaffected by our father's passing. The dip is the dip. It's not. Yeah, but I, I still feel like I'm going to the checkout during a sale and getting asked to pay more. That's well, true. Lucas, if you were willing bit. to pay 144 last week, shareholders won't yeah, like can you I looking interrupt opportunity. Right I'd rather you didn't, but you already um, did. So. so how did you think that went? How do they strike you as negotiators? I thought that was straight down the middle. Like that kind of stuff totally happens. Be like compliment followed by the, but it doesn't. All that kind of stuff is 100% the sort of conversation that goes on. If they want to do the deal like these guys do, they don't want the person to turn around and go like, well, go scratch, I'll see you later. So there's right. the complimenting followed by the, here are the reasons it's not compelling enough yet and all that kind of back and forth that you just heard there, absent the father figure passing away, is precisely the kind of conversation that happens in these, in these meetings while you're negotiating the terms of the deal. 
So negotiation is t- feels tense. Is it a bad omen or is that typical in tense like that? I always tell people who are going through M&A, get ready, every deal dies three deaths. When it's been dead three times, you're probably about to close. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you're at the finish line and then you're not. Those kinds of things 100% happen. They're super tense. It's really stressful. And it goes on a lot longer than it should. Yeah. These things tend to have sort of a momentum to them, these deals, Mm -hmm. you know. And when you end up on the deal bus, you know, you get to a point where you're like, Neither side may think this is going to close. It's totally going to close. They're far, so far down the tracks now that this thing's kind of got a momentum of its own. Early in the episode, Kendall talks about a deal in pretty simplistic terms. If they hit a certain number, it's good, and they sell. If they don't hit a certain number, it won't work, and the deal is bad. Is it that simple, or is, there, is he just bad at negotiating? It kind of is. You're looking for a valuation, the stock price, the number at which you'll sell. And then sometimes you even don't even talk cash and stock split or anything like that until after you've come to some agreement on the the overall number. So in many respects, it is that simple. Right. You know, and also, you know, as human psychology, people anchor on a whatever they've anchored on, right? Like, right. I'm not selling for anything less than a billion. Why? Because that's what, you know, schmucky.com sold for. And we're better than that guy. <laughs> You know, they sold for a billion, so we're not going selling yeah. for anything under a billion. It has nothing to do with the value of your company today and reality and the buyer, but that's how people are. So you totally get into these discussions where the buyer or seller anchors on something and, you know, it's hard to get their head off of it. So in many respects, it is that when he flashes the 144 on the gondola, mm-hmm. that happens. That's like, okay, here's the number. Remember when we go in there? Not a penny less than 144. That stuff totally happens. So I find Matson to be such a fascinating character. He's he's a freak, although we've met, you and I have met freaks like this. Can we talk (laughs) about the blood? Let's play the clip. I was seeing this girl, Uh and um, after after we broke up, because of some things that we said, uh, when when things were uh, nice and intense, you know, a sort of a nasty, uh, friendly, joke about about what I shouldn't do, um, is I, I sent her some of my blood. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, half a liter frozen blood brick as a joke. Uh, half a liter? Yeah. Wow. And then... Well, I mean, obviously, first of all, good one. Okay, that's a lot, but kudos to Shiv for staying calm and collected. From a business perspective, why is the story of his bizarre sexual harassment story mean for the deal? And what do you make of how she handled it? I mean, again, this is, we're getting into pretty fictional realms here. He's just trying to like show her what kind of a crazy person he is. And I guess if I can try to draw an analogy to real life, it's definitely the case that buyers will try to make you think like, hey, I'm crazy and liable to like bail on this at any moment. So mm-hmm. don't say anything that's going to offend me. So I think that's kind of what's going on here. And it's a negotiating thing, I thought. Do you think he trusts her? No, I thought it was a weird scene. And he's trying to get into her head a little bit, um, obviously, and try to maybe pull her in and separate her from the brothers. Mm-hmm. But it was a weird way of going about that. Yeah. Although it doesn't seem surprising to me that they would do this because a lot of people you and I know um, have a weird obsession with blood and mortality. (laughs) Yeah. There's a big obsession with longevity. I could make a list of four people I think would do something like this. (laughs) I'm sure we could all add to the list. But it's scary to think about people like Matson having so much power and influence in the world and being so decidedly odd, because he really is, too. It's all so strange. Um, Early in the episodes when they're discussing whether or not France is going to make it, how much of an impact can a CEO have on the world at large outside of interpersonal business warfare? Because, you know, Elon and Ukraine with Starlink. You just identified one. I think it's Mm -hmm. increasingly true that executives of the biggest companies in the world have an incredible amount of influence over geopolitical affairs. Mm -hmm. You just gave a very real practical example, like um, Elon's donation of the Starlink gear to the Ukrainian war effort, and Mm -hmm. whether he decides to pull that or not pull it or what have you, um, that has profound effects on, obviously, people's lives and global geopolitical events. And there are lots of those. But when you think about that, does someone like Madsen seem real to you? Yes. I mean, for sure. And as you know, like in some cases, the more powerful you get, the quirkier, the more curious and uh, strange the idiosyncrasies become. Um, So it's 100% there are people like that. I don't know that, again, 
I don't know that I've ever seen anyone describe something that they've done like that in, as part of a negotiation to that degree, but 100% those people exist. All right, last question. If you were buying Waystar, who'd be on your kill list? <laughs> who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Greg, cousin Greg makes it. That's it. <laughs> no, I, it's a long, 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 long list. Everybody. The great thing about this show is there are so few truly likable characters. And yet yeah. at the same time, each of them is individually likable in certain instances. And you empathize with some of them in certain instances. I'd get rid of Frank. Because <laughs> there's always a Frank. There for sure is always a Frank. I'm going to fire Frank. Uh, Greg is Greg. Who is a low hanging fruit deck? You could do better. Than that. <laughs> that was easy pickings for me. It was no non controversial. Anyway, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Dick Costello. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for inviting me. I want to thank my guest, Dick Costello, former CEO of Twitter, and Kieran Culkin, our very own Roman Roy. I really hope Roman doesn't learn about Matson's blood thing because it kind of sounds like a thing Roman would do. Roman, please don't send anyone your blood, including me. It's a bad look. Next week, we'll be talking about episode six. It's time to see who's going to make it out of this deal alive. New episodes of the podcast come out every Sunday night after the latest episode of Succession airs on HBO and HBO Max. Make sure to subscribe wherever you find your podcasts so you never miss an episode. The official HBO Succession podcast is a production of HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. Our executive producers at Pineapple are Barry Finkel and Gabrielle Lewis. Our producers are Elliot Adler, Ben Goldberg, and Noah Camuso. Our editor is Darby Maloney. Engineering and mixing by Hannes Brown. Production music is courtesy of HBO. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt, Kenya Reyes, and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts. And I am, of course, Kara Swisher. We'll see you next week. Shiv, we're, we're, we're death wrestling with ogres. Bah. You're reading documents is what you're doing, Ken. 